So if you chose option B um, as your option, well then this is quantum and nuclear physics. This is identical to the um, additional higher level topic, uh, which would be, I think it's topic 13. Yeah, this one right here, quantum physics and nuclear physics. These are going to be the exact same equations here. So I'm actually going to do these, but I'm going to take a look at them um, well on this instead, so we have a little bit more room to work. So if we look at this then, this first one, E equals HF, that has to do with the energy of a photon, which is one piece of light. Okay, so this right here, E would be the energy, and we can measure that in joules, or we can do it in electron volts. That's another common one, so EV. H is just a constant. You can look that one up, and well, let's take a look. So let's find H. It's on the second page of our data booklet. We can find here Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. That's in joule seconds, so we probably should use that as a proper unit. So that's just a constant, you can look it up. And then F, F is just the frequency of light. Maybe I'll put it down here. So F is just the frequency of light. And that's measured in hertz. What that means then, of course, you could convert that frequency to a wavelength. So it basically tells you this is the energy that a little piece of light has. That's E equals HF. Now we've got these two equations right here. Both of these are for the photoelectric effect. So we've got the same HF. That's the H here, and this is F, the frequency of the light. The only difference is we have this V right here. That V is a stopping voltage. So there we can set up a a circuit where we can actually stop this photoelectric effect from happening and if we do that then that would be the stopping voltage. E is still the charge of an electron. And you can look that one up, that's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And the only thing is we've got F0 that's called a threshold frequency. Better write that down. So threshold frequency. That will be measured in hertz. And finally we've got this phi. Now this phi here is actually considered the work function. That's the amount of energy that a photon needs to have in order to kick something out, in order to kick out an electron. So this is the work function. That'll also be measured in joules or electron volts, all depending on what you feel like using. And finally, this Emax, that will be the um, kinetic energy of the electrons that are kicked out. So what we have then is in photoelectric effect, we have, we have light that's incident on a metal surface. So maybe I'll draw that in red like this. So we have a metal surface here, and we have light coming in. We normally draw light as a squiggly line like this. This is a photon. And what does it do? It hits a metal surface and kicks out an electron. This is the photoelectric effect. So the whole question is, how fast are these going? Well, then we can look at Emax. But what I think is really good about this right here is that these right here match each other. In other words, the work function here, which is the amount of energy that the uh, light needs to have in order to kick out an electron, that, ener that work function is the same as HF0, which is the threshold frequency. And the threshold frequency represents, uh, well, the frequency below which you won't have any photoelectric effect. That's because the light, the photons, didn't have enough energy to kick out these electrons because they're being held by the material. Now this maximum kinetic energy, that is equal to EV. So this is the maximum kinetic energy of your photoelectrons is equal to the charge times V. And if you look at this E max equals EV, that relates very well to this equation from topic 5, which is right here. This is this one right here, this top one, that nobody seems to look at, but I think it's really important. This tells you VE equals the kinetic energy. 
That means the voltage times the charge is equal to the kinetic energy of these particles. So in this case, then that's where this came from, this E max equals EV. See, they're actually the same. So that's useful, I think. Now, let's take a look at this one right here. P equals H over lambda. That is, well, P is momentum. Now, momentum is normally measured in um, kilogram meters per second, but it turns out you can write the momentum as other units as well. So this is the, P is the momentum. This is actually all known as de Broglie. So this is de Broglie's hypothesis, where he said that uh, the moment, well, light has a momentum. Normally you'd think momentum has to be P equals MV, you know, mass times uh, velocity, like we learned in topic two. Where's topic two? That's here. So normally we think momentum has to be mass times velocity. But since it's light, light has no mass. So you think, oh, so light must not have a momentum. But de Broglie figured out that, no, light does have a momentum. It's just there's a different equation for it. So because light doesn't have a mass, we can actually use this for it. So say that, the light, that anything with a wavelength also has momentum. What's really cool is the converse is true. Something with momentum then has a wavelength. So what that means is that uh, even particles that are moving, so solid objects, if they have a momentum, so that means if they're moving, then they have a wavelength, which means I could figure out your wavelength depending on uh, how fast it is that you're moving, which sounds really weird. But you actually have a wavelength, so do electrons, so do solid objects. Now this one right here, this next one, EK equals N squared H squared over 4ML squared. This is all about the electron in a box. So I'm going to maybe do that one in red here. So we'll maybe figure that one out here. So this is electron in a box. So this has to do with some quantum mechanics things. So we're here what we're doing is trying to figure out, okay, well, n, n is just some number. So it's a 1 or 2 or 3, dot, dot, dot. So this tells us essentially it's like we have standing waves being created in a box. Uh, H is still that constant, which is the same here. It's a Planck's constant here. Me, that's the mass of an electron. And you can look that up because you don't have to know that by heart. You can just look it up. So the mass of an electron, that you can find. Uh, that's on page 2, I think it is. Yeah, the electron rest mass. Or you could say it in MeV per C squared if you prefer. Or in um, atomic mass units. So that's that one. Now what do we do about L? Well, L is just the length of the box. So here we talk about the standing waves that are created inside a box here. So that's, that's really what these are here represent. Where EK, of course, is your kinetic energy. So that's your energy, which is measured in joules. Mass of your electron can be in kilograms, or we can have an MeV per C squared. The length of the box, that'll normally be in meters. So this is how we can deal with this one. Uh, your energy could be in joules or it can be in electron volts. All depends on what you felt like using for your masses here. So that's that one. And finally, we have this one right here. This one, maybe I'll do it in a different color. It's getting a bit messy, but oh well. This one right here, that is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Heisenberg's. And now this one... This is actually a really interesting one. It's too bad we don't actually get to talk about it very much in the course because it's really, really fascinating. So it all talks about how you can know some things. Well, delta x, that's the uncertainty. On position. Where delta p is the uncertainty on the momentum. uncertainty on your momentum. So what it essentially tells you is you can know the position or the momentum but not both. You know as one gets better the other one has to get worse. And so that essentially tells you why um, it's unfortunate but you can't actually tell something's position really well and its speed, right, because speed is contained within momentum. You can know one or the other really well but not both. 
And similar thing right here. This right here is also Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So maybe I'll just kind of draw a little line here saying this is also Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, except we have delta E, which is the uncertainty on energy, and this is delta T, the uncertainty on time. So those are related to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And then we have, maybe I'll make this in green, all four of these have to do with uh, decay here. So this is now with radioactive decay. So these other things were all about quantum physics, everything here. But these last four are all about decay. So now in this first equation right here, n, n equals the, let's say the final amount, all well, the final mass, let's say, um, where n zero is the initial mass that you're looking at. Remember in decay we're looking at something like this where you know you start off with some at some time we have you know how many uh, maybe what your mass is that could be in kilograms there's lots of different units we use for the mass here. So it turns out that um, at the beginning of whatever you're looking at you have a full amount of whatever it is you're starting with and then it goes down. This is a exponentially decaying function here. So that's what n and n0 represent. e, well that's just an exponential equation. So that just tells you this is e to the power of something. This e here is not the same as this over here. This e is an actual constant, it's a number. Whereas this over here is a mathematical function. So this is when you learn in math class about e to the x and how um, e to the x undoes natural log and things like that, well that's where this one comes in. So we have t. Well, that's just the time. And again, this can be measured actually in seconds, days, years, hours. It all depends on what you feel like using there. But lambda, this is the important one, that is the decay constant. Now, the decay constant represents the probability of something decaying within a certain time frame. Well, in fact, it's per second. But that actually has units of... Um, well, normally seconds to the minus one, or it can be days to the minus one, or hours to the minus one. This time could be in seconds, but like I said, it could also be in days or hours or years, whatever you want. Now, A, A is the activity. Activity, whoops, uh, my spelling doesn't look very nice here, so maybe I'll fix it. So A is the activity. What that means, that's, that's really the decays per second. But we have an alternate unit for those, those are called becquerels. So we can also say that the activity is measured in becquerels. So you can see how the activity is actually related to um, these different equations here. So it's very similar. And the last thing we need to look at is T1 half, which is the half-life. And again, that could be measured in seconds, but it could also be measured in days, hours, years, whatever. So this basically tells you how the half-life of something is related to its decay constant. And you could actually start off with this first initial equation right here, and you could say, well, what happens when I'm at my half-life? Well, that half-life, what that means is um, you've got exactly half the final mass than you had initially, which means you can set n equal to n0 over 2, and that means your n zeros would cancel out, and away you could go, you could set your time equal to t one half, and from there you can just solve for t. Turns out if you do it right, well you want to try to undo an e to the power of something, so you take the natural log of both sides, and if you're really careful with it, you end up with t one half equals ln2 over lambda. ln is just a natural log, it's just a mathematical function. So these are all the equations for quantum physics and nuclear physics. There are lots of them, but uh, hopefully this helps to make it a little bit more clear what each of them does and how they're used.